So I guess we're going to start at the beginning because you're one of the voice actors with a pretty fascinating story where you wanted to, if I understood it right, you wanted to basically meet your hero, Mel Blanc, and work with Looney Tunes. And you actually got to meet your hero and work in Looney Tunes and, you know, continue the tradition that he started with that, uh, you know, the Hanna-Barbera classic. So uh, why don't you share a little bit about growing up with a hero like Mel Blanc and then getting to meet him and how that led to what you are today? Uh, you know, I was really just a fan of the Looney Tunes and uh, the Warner Brothers cartoons. So uh, my mom tells a story about when I was about five years old, she would hear, I'd be in, you know, Saturday morning watching cartoons. She'd hear the cartoon in the, in the other room and then she'd hear a line repeated. And she would walk in and say, why are they repeating the same line? And I said, well, one's the TV, one's me. So she noticed I had a knack for this, and, you know, I just decided I wanted to be Porky Pig when I was about five years old. So uh, we lived in the Midwest. There really wasn't an opportunity to be Porky Pig living in the Midwest. So um, I was fortunate that my dad took a job in L.A. when I was 14, and I just I called Mel Blank at home. And, um, you know, during the course of the conversation, he mentioned the name of the studio he was working at that week. He didn't say the day or the time, but he mentioned the name. So after I finished talking to him, I called the studio pretending to be his assistant just so I could get the information of what time and what day, and they gave it to me. <laughs> so uh, I told my mom I'm going to skip school, and we're going to go watch Mel Blanc work. And so when we got to the studio, I told the receptionist that we were guests of Mel Blanc, and she showed me where he was recording, and I told his producer that the receptionist told us we could come in, and we just sat and watched him work. So it was, it was just pretty cool to watch, uh, watch him do his thing. So back then, security in those type of places were was not very high. Well, you know, I was also 14 years old and kind of innocent. You know, I mean, I really, I think, you know, sometimes ignorance is bliss. I didn't know not to do stuff like this. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, the bottom line is there's really, it's not like going through an airport. It's a recording studio. So um, it was it was pretty easy to do. Wow. So, um you you watched Mel Blanc do what he did, and then how did this lead you to eventually becoming Porky Pig and carrying on the tradition of the Looney Tunes, which you know still exists today? Well, watching him work, I'm realizing he's still working. You know, he's still doing what he's doing, and he's doing it quite well. So, you know, uh, logic told me that if I'm ever going to have this this opportunity, I need to already be in the business. So I called Hanna Barbera, and they referred me to a guy named Dawes Butler, who was almost every voice that Mel was, and he was, you know, Yogi Bear and Huckleberry Hound and Captain Crunch. And I studied with Dawes, and I studied with anybody that offered a, a voiceover class for about four years. Um, also studied acting for two years, and then brought for three. So when I was ready for that demo, or when I was, you know, I, I was preparing to be ready for that demo. Uh, I thought that my odds of getting representation and working were, were pretty good, and they were. I was, I made a demo, and I sent it to Casey Kasem, who gave it to his agent, who signed me to a contract, and um, you know, it took me a good another five years of uh, hit or miss auditioning before I was able to quit the day jobs. But um, I would say it was from from first class to working actor it was about a nine year journey. Wow! And that was that was in. Uh, I guess 87, 88 was when I quit my first day job, or my last day job, I should say, and Mel Blanc passed away in 89, and my first job doing Porky was 1990. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I happened to be working in the business. I had a great agent at the time, and I was able to get into these auditions. There you know, were no guarantees, but it was all strategically very planned. Yeah. So, uh, you know, over the past couple of years, you know, a lot of people have lost – quote unquote, they're Hollywood heroes with Robin Williams passing and, um, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman and so on passing. Well, do you remember what it was like the day you learned Mel Blanc died and what was going through your head? It was weird. I remember exactly where I was. I was driving down Wilshire Boulevard and I heard on the radio that he'd passed away. And, and I pulled over and I, I, my mind went from 
you know, I'm mourning the loss to now what do I do? And then I felt guilty by thinking about me at that point. It was a horrible mixed emotion. I was having terrible Jewish guilt. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was it was a, an organic thing. You know, he passed away, and um, a few weeks later, they started holding auditions for these characters. But I've been sending Warner Brothers tapes, gosh, since I was a kid. Um, I don't know if they ever got anybody, but I, I was sending them, you know, cassette tapes of me recording, you know, my version of these characters for years. But it was a, I had, oh my goodness, anywhere from I would say like a like a dozen or so auditions and callbacks before I got my first job. So the very first time you recorded as Porky Pig and when also recorded as Looney Tunes and some of the roles that he's done, was it more of a feeling of? You know, this is for Mel Blanc, this is, you know, memory of this, or is this, I'm actually doing this, I'm a Looney Tune, this is weird, or a bit of both? Um, mm, I'm not sure, because to this day, I don't have a contract to play this character. None of us who do classic characters have, a like, a lifetime contract. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, actors for hire, so they just happen to be hired, have hired me for the last 25 years. But um, the first time I did it, uh, I was terrified. It was for a show called Tiny Tune Adventures. Okay, and um, just a little loony. I remember that show. <laughs> there you go. Um, I, yeah, I was terrified. Um, I didn't. I mean, in my head, I did a good Porky Pig, but I knew that I had a lot to prove. Um, I just kind of dove in. My, I guess my philosophy was, you know, if I don't ever do this again, at least I got to do it once. And you know, Andrea Romano was the casting director and the voice director. She is one of the best in the business. And um, she was she was phenomenal. She was um, I couldn't imagine doing this with anybody else. Um, so it was a brand new series; it hadn't aired yet. So um, yeah, it was uh, it was a combination of emotions. When I first started doing Porky, after that, you know, sessions subsequent sessions, they would play me um, like a fifteen minute reference tape of Mel, and the, and the lines were from cartoons from different different decades and I would say which one do you want because Mel's Porky from the 30s sounded different from the 40s which sounded different from the 50s and they hadn't thought it through that much so I just pretty much you know for me Mel kind of nailed it uh in the mid 50s uh which would be the Duck Dodgers Drip Along Daffy Robin Hood Daffy era mm -hmm. so that's where I, I, I kind of concentrated for my performance but I don't think any of us who do these classic characters sound a bit like Mel Blanc. He was a genius. None of us will even come close. I, my, myself, definitely, I don't come close to him. Well, so today, I don't even think about Mel Blanc or what he did with the character. I do my best to um, to keep the integrity of the character, uh, but it's really I'm not even comparing myself to him because I can't. He's he he was he was an original. Yeah, that was uh, something we were actually. Yeah, I, I work at a at a, at a hospital on a children's unit, and yesterday it's their spring break. So yesterday, we decided to introduce them to Looney Tunes because none of these kids these days know what Looney Tunes is, beyond a couple of shorts in front of movies. And so we had them watch Space Jam and Looney Tunes back in action and some of the newer stuff that my generation grew up with. And it was kind of amazing how they they didn't believe that one person used to do all these voices, and now there's what uh, six of you guys who do most of them or something like that. There's a, there's a handful of us. We all kind of share the characters. There have been several Bugs Bunnies over the years, and a couple of us have done Tweety. So there's there's no, uh, I mean, I don't know if there's six or if it's ten. I have no, I, I don't I don't know right now. But um, yeah, you're right. Uh, when the Warner Brothers stores closed several years ago, um, the merchandising uh, with other Tunes kind of died down. In the last, I don't know, ten years, ten eleven years or so, I've done three series. With the characters, we did Duck Dodgers, we did the Looney Tunes show, and we're doing a show now called Wabbit, which hasn't debuted yet. Um, but TV doesn't show the classic Looney Tunes the way they used to. So they're not as in the public eye as, you know, they were, as they did when we were kids. But um, this new Wabbit show is pretty well written. It's, um, I you know, if I go to a session and I'm laughing at these characters and it, it, they're doing something right. I thought Duck Dodgers did that too, but uh, Wabbit is just a really, really well-written show. So one question I have is, uh, out of all these characters you used to do imitations of, why why Porky Pig? 
Uh, it's a good question. It's a question I'm asked all the time, and, it's an, and I really don't have any other answer other than the fact that um, I found humor in his voice and humor in his personality. Um, I like how – well, first of all, I, I broke down how to do the stutter when I was really young. There's a, there's a formula to the stutter, um, and while he's stuttering, he's thinking of an ad lib, or I'm thinking of an ad lib. So from a comedic actor standpoint, it's fun to portray. But I guess the real truth of the matter is I like them because I can do them. I I can't do Yosemite Sam. I do a lousy Bugs Bunny, but Porky is something I can do, and and I I actually am more comfortable playing that character than I am doing my own voice. Wow. So, um, if you, I'm a generation of you know the Space Jam generation, and that was basically the pivotal movie of my childhood. Um, what do you think keeps bringing people back to Looney Tunes? Because you know, Looney Tunes, as we said, took a break for a bit. It disappeared. And then uh, I think it was, what, two years ago, they started having some of those, like the Wile E. Coyote shorts in front of some movies and tried, and brought back the Looney Tunes show. What do you think keeps bringing people back to these characters that have been around for over 80 years now, I guess? Well, I mean, it's, it's it's completely up to the studio. It's up to Warner Brothers to, to put them out there. So, um, you know, I wish... I had a say in this, but I'm just an actor for hire. Um, but to be personally honest, if I were, if I had all the money and I was running the studio, I would put an animated shirt in front of every Warner Brothers movie. Um, I think the audiences would love it, but it's the theater owners that don't want them because a six minute short in front of every run uh, takes up time and they could, they could actually run another movie or another screening and get more money from the audience by not having a short. But I think the audiences would love to see shorts again. Especially since now, you know, most kid movies, the parents are going with them and the parents all grow up with Looney Tunes. And so it's a good way to introduce them because I don't know, watching the Looney Tunes movies the other day, I had to talk to kids like, you know, why can Wiley, why can't Wiley Coyote go through the holes that Roadrunner goes through? Why is it always a painting? Why, you know, can they stretch themselves? Why do anvils always fall? Why do his machines never work? And so on. And, it was it was fun just being able to talk to kids like this, and I guess seeing shorts in front of movies would give parents opportunities to talk to their children about these classic cartoons that they grew up with. Well, these cartoons were never made for kids. These cartoons were made for adults, always. And they didn't start associating them with children until television because they needed programming. You know, when TV was in its infancy, they needed programming, and they had these cartoons already in the can. So between Popeye and the, the Fleischer Popeyes and the, and the Looney Tunes, um, and this was before, of course, Hanna Barbera had, uh, you know, uh, Yogi Bear and all those made for TV cartoons. They needed programming. So Saturday morning was the, the Bugs Bunny show. And then actually, the Bugs Bunny show was a primetime series, uh, when it first debuted. Okay. Didn't go to Saturday morning for years. So these cartoons were never made for, for kids. Kids enjoyed them because they were cartoons, they were fun. But there was a lot of sophisticated humor. In fact, the, the show Wabbit, what we're doing right now, has a lot of sophisticated humor that I'm just loving because the adults are going to like it as much as the kids. So it's like the the the, the Kill the Wabbit um, uh, short, the one with uh, the Kill the Wabbit, Kill the Wabbit. Uh, what's up for Doc? With Bugs just so, so it's that sort of humor again where they're bringing back the, if you're an adult, you get one level and you get the most of the joke. If you're a kid, it just looks funny and you get more right. with the flat. Right, right. Exactly. And that's why it's like the, the classic Bullwinkle cartoons were absolutely made for adults, you know. Um, so, you know, kids today have a ton of cartoons to choose from, more than when I was a kid, because there are you know, networks devoted just for animation. But they've got everything from Nick Jr. to um, Adult Swim and everything in between. Um, you know, the, the audience for The Simpsons is, I would say, primarily adult. College kids, uh, Futurama, same thing certainly robot chicken. So um, there's um, there's a lot of stuff out there for the little kids, but there's plenty of stuff for the adults. And I think the Looney Tunes fit both. Now, that actually leads us to a nice transition because you got to be on Robot Chicken, and you've got, mm-hmm. actually got to play – quite a few times you've got to play the voice of Luke Skywalker in well, a handful of games and some shorts and Robot Chicken and stuff. Um, being a voice actor, what's it like stepping into a role that, I guess, he, I guess he's better known as a voice actor than an actor. Well, maybe not now, but he was for about twenty years. That another voice actor that you might have worked with, made famous. 
Well, I mean, first of all, I turned down the audition originally uh, because I kept saying to my, um, I kept saying to my agent, um, I can't do Mark. I can't, I can't, I can't, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I can't do his voice. And so she called the, the people at, at LucasArts and said, this is, I think the first, the first thing I did was, was with the games. And she told them that I'm, you know, graciously declining. And they said, we'd like to see him anyway. So I walked into the audition. I said, I don't do Mark. And they said, don't do Mark, do Luke. And I went, oh, okay, that I can do. <laughs> so I didn't concentrate on sounding like Mark Hamill. I concentrated on, on doing Luke Skywalker. And again, it's sort of like, it's like, you know, it's like Porky Pig. I'm never going to be Luke Skywalker. That is Mark Hamill's character. He owns that. And, you know, he's, he will always be that character. I just happen to be kind of playing that character when they – when they need me. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not a humongoid Star Wars fanatic. I enjoy the movies, but I'm not the diehard fan that a lot of people are. So every time I work on a Star Wars project, I have to be re-educated on how to pronounce things. And, you know, I've, I've got the pre and post Jedi loop down now, but it took me a while. Um, it's been about 20 years since I've been doing that character. And I haven't done them in a while because they've been using a different universe for the longest time for Clone Wars and for the games and whatnot. So um, I have to dust off your Luke again with post. What's that? Year, now, pretty soon I have to dust off your Luke again for 30 years later, Luke. Well, but see, I, you know, if if you if you listen to Mark now, he doesn't sound like he did then, mm-hmm. you know, because you know it's been 30 years for all of us. So you know, who knows what they're going to do for the character now? I've I've, I've not been asked to do him for a while. But, um, you know, the last thing I think I did for Luke was the last Robot Chicken special. Um, but it was pure parody and, and, and a lot of fun to do. So when Robot Chicken, you get to work with Seth Green and company who are huge fanatics of stuff. You know, they almost got – they were – well, they made that Star Wars parody show, Detours, and it hasn't aired yet. But what's right. it like working on a show that's parodying Star Wars made by people who are such devout fans as the Robot Chicken team is? It's just way too much fun. Seth is quite possibly one of the best animation directors out there. I don't think he knows it. Um, the writing is just so much fun. It's it's a party, you know. Um, we did uh, not for the last Star Wars one. Well, actually, actually, I did the I did the commentary for the last Star Wars one, but we just did a commentary for one for this past season, and it's uh, it'll be on the DVD. But it's just um, it's just one of the most enjoyable. Uh, groups, production companies to work with, and Seth is, he's a great director, great actor, great producer. Um, it's privilege. So when it comes to a show like that, is it all scripted, or is there improv that's allowed to be in there as well if it ends up being? I would say it's 99% scripted, um, and every once in a while, we'll just throw some stuff in, but I, it, it's, for the majority of it is it is scripted. Okay. And then, Okay. Because uh, a lot of my friends and people who watch Robot Chicken, sometimes we wonder, because some of the humor is like, how do you write stuff like this? Good writers, you know? And that's all I can tell you is it's just really, really great writing. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it, 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 it's on the page. Wow, I guess that's what happens when you have fans making material like that. And then a lot of you've also got to work with a lot of other major franchise projects. You've worked with Disney. You've worked mm-hmm. with Marvel. You've worked with classic anime. Um, so I'm going gonna to move just um, – this is a question from a fan who wants to know because he wants to – he's studying uh, – he's doing voice classes and so on right now. I think he's in Berkeley or something like that. But he wants to know when it comes to being a voice actor, people like you and D. Bradley Baker and so on who can do like the animal noises and the grunts and the growls and characters like that, is that – how do you prepare yourself to be able to do the stuff like the Emperor's New Groove Squirrel or uh, what D does with like the Avatar stuff with the with the animals and so on? How do you prepare to be able to do that aspect of voice work versus just doing the voices and imitations and stuff? It starts with you know you said voice acting and people forget that it's acting. You've got to make those sounds come to life. You've got to give them emotion. You got to give them uh, range. You got to get, again, you know, the script is a skeleton. Your job is to give it a body. So it's not about what you sound like. It's about what you do with your acting and your emotions. So 
the biggest mistake people make is they they'll dive into a voiceover class or voice classes without a, an acting foundation. Um, I suggest people study acting, theater, uh, improv, and then study voice uh, and voiceover. Um, you know, you've got to make those characters come to life. It's not. There's no such thing as a good voice because there's no such thing as a bad voice. There are only good actors and bad actors. You know, D is a brilliant actor. He can make a cricket, you know, uh, sound emotional. So same with Frank Welker. Um, so my advice for anybody who wants to do this is become the best actor you possibly can and then study voiceover. Okay. And uh, I guess another one from a, a different fan. He says, you've done anime, which is dubbing for the most part. You've done video games. You've done mm -hmm. animated TV shows. You've done movies. You've done commercials um, and shorts and so on. Is there any aspect of voice acting which you would recommend people not do or that you prefer above others? Or what are the challenges when it comes to different levels of voice acting that people like you have to be able to overcome and, and do? Oh, good question. Um, I would say that people should do whatever it is that they love. Um, you know, for what I do, I mean, diversity is key. I do commercials, I do promos, I do animation, I do games, I do narration. The only aspect of voiceover that I don't do is audiobooks, and that's my choice. Because I, the idea of sitting in a room reading for eight hours, um, and today voice actors have to be their own producer. you got to edit down your, your work, and you're paid for the finished recording rather than the time it takes to do it. That just doesn't appeal to me. But it does appeal to a great number of people. So God bless them, go with God and do audiobooks, but it's not for me. Um, you know, even if you want to do animation, if you want to do animation, you got to live in Los Angeles. That's where it's done. But mm, the majority of the agents out there, and you do have to have an agent to, to get the auditions for animation, um, the agents won't represent you just for animation. For the most part, you've got to do commercials. That's day-to-day -day bread and butter for those of us who, who do a lot of animation. So, I'm, you know, this morning I read for a half a dozen commercials. I didn't read for, I read for one cartoon, but a half a dozen commercials. Isn't the so, commercials like the cartoons, places where you actually get your money from residuals and so on versus video games and others where I'm oh, yeah. pretty sure oh, yeah. it's all up front? Yeah, those of us who make a living at this, it's not, a, you know, it's not about the session fee. It's about the residuals. So that's how, that's how we make our living as voice actors, um, be it on TV, DVD, uh, Blu-ray, whatever. You know, that's, that's, it's the subsequent money that really allows you to make a living at this. Um, games don't pay residuals right now, um, something that my fellow actors would love to try to get. Um, and anime doesn't pay residuals. Uh, anime, which is more difficult to do because you've got to match sync as well as act and um, stay in character, etc. Much more difficult to do. The, the skill level far outweighs uh, prelay. Um, quite possibly the greatest fandom in the world are the anime fans. God love you people. But from a make-a-living standpoint, it's it's not a lot of money. So you don't go into anime for the money. You go into it because you love it. So so anime, is it because you're doing dubbing versus the original recording? Because wouldn't it, I don't know, in, in theory, wouldn't the people who did the original recording in Japanese or whatever language it was get residuals versus the ones who just do the dubbing? Is, is that why there's no residuals? They don't get residuals. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if they get residuals in, in Japan. I have no idea how it's done. I don't think they do. Um, maybe they do. I don't know. But yeah, we are. You know, the 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 dialogue is translated into English, and um, you have to watch the film, and read, and perform, and and act and stay in sync all at the same time. And so it is. It is a definite uh, specific skill. Oh, I guess that that's why people like say Richard Epcar and. Uh... Jeff Nimoy and others do like the translating and the directing and so on as well when they do anime versus just the voices. Well, they're also good at it. I mean, Richard Epcar is one of the, I mean, all around best anime writers, actors, directors out there. You know, he's, he's, I've worked for Richard forever. He's a genius. Um, but, you know, he's, he's probably getting paid for all aspects of it, including the acting okay. when he does the voice work. So, um, you know, there's more of a, uh, I guess, a, a financial incentive to do all those skills. I couldn't do it. It's not something I, I don't know how to translate. I don't know how to voice direct anime. So God bless him for that. Okay. So here's another uh, listener question. 
Uh, they want to know if you've ever worked on a project that you did not expect much from. Like you, you, you're doing a project because it's an audition you got and you got hired for it, and it just ended up being something a lot more special than you thought it would be. Like a project that caught you off guard, uh, how good and how special it ended up being. All the time, all the time, um, and and mostly anime. Uh, you know. Um, I didn't know Akira was going to be something big. I didn't know Spirited Away was going to be an Oscar-winning film. Um, you know, every once in a while, you you do a day on a film. When you do a feature film, not anime, but a prelay feature film, you don't usually get to see the entire script. You only get to see the pages you're working on. So I will work on a film for one or two days and three or four years, go see the movie, and go, oh, that's the story. Oh, that's that's the cool story. Oh, wow, I mean, I, that's fun. I'm I'm glad to be a part of this. Um, so yeah, you know, it's not it's not something that you expect that you know your work is going to be something that is that fulfilling and satisfying for the most part. I'd say for most actors, it's it, it's a job and it pays the bills. And every once in a while, you get to do that little something something where you're like, wow, I I, I actually get to be a part of this. This is really cool. Well, the film like Spirited Away uh, with, you know, legendary Miyazaki um, directed and also the one he won his Oscar for who he recently retired. Uh, did you actually get to, when you did the English dub, was that working through him or was it working through, I think, Disney distributes those? Never met the man in my life. Um, I was, it was actually the people at Pixar oh. who hired because I had already worked with them uh, for on, on a variety of films and uh, for both Spirited Away and Ponyo, those were uh, the Pixar people who I actually worked with. So, um, but I've never met Miyazaki. That's a shame. I, well, I don't think he had anything to do with the English dub. I think he just had he he did the original. Okay, so he did the original. That's, an, that's, an, that's an assumption, but but because I never saw him at the sessions, but you know, he I, he might have had approval. I don't know. Has have you ever done an anime where the director or someone? had input, had an approval? Because you've done like Lupin the Third and Accurate and, you know, quite a few famous, famous animes, or is it pretty much you guys recorded it, they, they hand it over to the American company or British company or whoever it is to actually do the dubbing and hope it gets it right? I Honestly, I don't know that part of the business, so I don't know. Um, as far as I know, it's a licensing thing, and the people who dub it in English license the characters. Um, I'm assuming that they've got uh, the creative approval um, but I really don't know what the process is. I just know when I go to go to work, uh, it's me and the director. There's, you know, when you do uh, anime, you're usually by yourself, um, so you're you don't have any other actors to work off of. If you're the first person to record the project, there's no other voice uh, in your headphones, no other actor recorded. If you're the third or fourth, you might have somebody else to work off of. You can just listen and react to them. If you're doing an animated feature, um, you're most of the time working by yourself, you and the director. So when I did The Emperor's New Groove, where I played a squirrel, um, all of my scenes were with Patrick Warburton. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've never been in the studio with a man. We did two. We did, a, we did the feature. We did the straight to DVD sequel, and we did three years on a series, and I've never been in a studio with a man. Wow. Um, but it, it takes a good director. It takes a really good director to – remember what the previous actor did, or if you're the first actor to work, remember what you did for for the next actor that comes in. But, you know, it's great editing, great directing, great producing that makes chemistry on between between two actors in a feature. And when you do TV, when you do episodic television like Looney Tunes show or, or um, oh, what, what about Clarence, uh, you know, Avengers Assembled, uh, some of the stuff I've done recently, I don't have as many of the cast members in the room as possible because acting is reacting. You know, having them to react off of is kind of important as an actor. Wow, because like uh, just a little bit on that person in the group, like you guys, your interactions with him is you know half the well not half, but a lot of the funniest moments in the film because it's the it's the junior chipmunk, it's the chipmunk talk and the balloons and the that's a lot of the humor they have there. And it you you can't tell that you guys weren't together because the reactions are kind of flawless. That's and I did a day in the film. And they did some test screenings, and they liked this Bucky Squirrel character, so they kept bringing me back, writing more stuff. So it, it and, and and this just goes to show that 
there really are no small parts. I mean, this was a one day, like one hour job that I did that ended up being a comic relief in a series. So, you know, listen to actors, don't go, oh, I've only got one or two lines. One or two lines can lead to something else. And you could be playing the lead in something and go to see the movie and go, oh, they replaced me, and they don't tell you. So, you know, that it, there's no rhyme or reason to this business. <laughs> so with a rule like that, do they just say audition with a squirrel voice? What happened was I didn't even audition. Um, they just hired me to play a squirrel because it was a bunch of people I've, I've, I had a working relationship with. So I go to Disney, and they said, um, so basically uh, there's this character, Kronk, who speaks squirrel, and he kind of, he can translate what you're saying. So he'll say to your character, squeak, squeak, and squeak, squeak. You'll say stuff, and he'll translate it because he speaks squirrel language. And I said, do you want me to say squeak, squeak, and squeak, squeak? And they said, no, we want you to create your own language. And I said, well, can I think about it for a few minutes? And they said, sure. So I went outside, and the, the lot at Disney looks very much like a park. It's got lots of trees and grass and park benches, and I'm sitting on a park bench, and I'm like, squeak, squeak, and squeak, squeak. How do I, what do I do? So I swear to you, a little squirrel ran down a tree, came up to me, stood on his hind legs, and he went, I want to go, I want I went, thank you. So I went inside, and I said to the director, Mark Dindle, I was, I want to go, and he goes, that, that works. <laughs> so basically, all I did was I read Patrick Warburton's lines when he was translating. You know, if, if he was saying, um, you know, he says she's an evil, evil person and we should be afraid, I would read those in jibber-jabber, but give the emotion of those lines. That's what he was going to be translating. So, you know, again, I had to use acting skills to figure out how am I going to take this jibber jabber character and bring life to this scene. And there, there was a, a structure to it. So, you know, that's where the acting skills come in. Wow. That's really cool. Especially since if people who, you know, looked at the, the bonus features and background of that movie, that movie was supposed to be originally a serious dark film and then it ended up being. How and I worked on it when it, I, I worked on it. It was called kingdom of the sun and I did a day on it and we were playing like, Aztec slaves or something, and we were, like, being beaten and dragging pieces of pyramids and things. And then about a year later, I'm called up, and they said, oh, no, it's become a comedy now with David Spade. Can you play a squirrel? And I'm like, the same movie? <laughs> and I said, well, it's been a little reworked. Okay, fine. Just a little. <laughs> yeah, that that's one of the films that definitely, I think, benefited from being changed. I, I I agree. I mean, I I only worked on it one day when it was the heavy drama, but um, it was a blast. It was one of my favorite projects. And then you also got to do what I'm assuming was ADR for a famous Spielberg project. Who uh, I don't was uh was Gremlins? How you got introduced to Joe Dante and got to be in some of the Looney Tunes stuff later? Because I know he directed some Looney Tunes, if I recall. Not that I know of. Um, I, he, I know that I think he did. What he? Oh, that's right. He did do Looney Tunes back. Totally unrelated. Uh, Gremlins was the first big job I ever did. Um, and the, I, I don't. I mean, it was many, many years between Gremlins and Looney Tunes back in action. But I do know that Joe Dante was a huge Looney Tunes fan, and he used Chuck Jones uh, in uh, in cameo parts in Gremlins. And um, did a little animated bugs, I believe, in the Gremlins too. Yeah. Um, but uh, Looney Tunes back in action. I I I heard a rumor he he always wanted to do a a biopic about Termite Terrace. I don't I mean he never did. <laughs> um, but you know I hadn't seen or worked with a man between Gremlins and Back in Action, so it was kind of fun, you know, to uh, to work with him on that. But Gremlins was. The first big job I ever did. Um, that was fun. That was that was a that was a pretty cool project. That's probably one of my favorite movies of all time. It definitely holds up with its zaniness, and it's you can you can tell that they they liked the type of humor that was Looney Tunes and that type of stuff because it's oh totally it's absolutely live action Looney Tunes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So having worked on Gremlins, um, I, I don't know how, who would necessarily be the one working with you, but 
there's always been a disagreement between fans if it's more of a Spielberg movie or a Joe Dante movie. Having worked on it, would you have any input on who would you say was that movie was? You know, I would say the answer is yes. It was it was both. Um, Dante was with us on the stage. Um, sound guy named Mark Mangini was actually the guy who auditioned me and uh, I think edited uh, the the sounds and the and the recordings. Um, but it was absolutely a Steven Spielberg production. Um, you know, you could absolutely tell his influence working on the film and the, the film itself. Um, but it was, I remember when I auditioned for it, they showed us nothing from the film. They were very, very secretive. And they said, can you do the sound of a gremlin exploding in a microwave? And I said, well, what's a gremlin? <laughs> and they said, well, remember that little creature who was kind of like with Jabba the Hutt, that little laughing creature? I said, yeah, they said, kind of like that. I said, but why is he exploding in the microwave? Well, because he is. So they said that that, that was one of my auditions. And one of my auditions was, imagine a gremlin on top of a ceiling fan that goes out of control and he flies across the room and I think it lands in a jukebox or something. But again, I didn't know what a gremlin was or the context of this in the film because they showed us nothing. It wasn't until we started working on the film that I knew anything about it. And even then, I didn't know that much about it because you, you do it out of context. You do it out of sequence. So that's a film that I, I remember there was huge controversy about when it came out, and that's one of the reasons PG-13 exists, because the advertising basically shows the cute gizmo and Mogwai and Christmas and singing, and you know, it, it was good. And then you watch it, and you know, gremlins go into blenders and microwaves and yeah. throw saw blades at each other. Was that a film that when you, when you finally saw the final product – that surprised you what you were actually doing or did you, by the time it came out, you had an idea of what to expect? And well, I knew the, I knew the scenes we did because we did do it ADR. Um, I, you know, I wasn't quite sure how it was all going to be, you know, cut together because I wasn't doing it in, in, in sequence, but, um, no, I knew, I knew, <laughs> I knew exactly what the film was when I was working on it. So the reactions people had, you, uh, I'm assuming people who worked on the project were either shocked that people were surprised or they were just like, <laughs> this is going to be fun. I, I I guess because I saw it with adults and not with kids that um, it was all taken as, you know, just kind of dark humor rather than, ooh, this is scary for kids. But I believe it was a PG movie. Yeah, it was a PG, and then they created PG-13 because of that one, and I think Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom with Melting Faces. Oh, no, Rich right. Dark with Melting Faces. So, so you got to do voices like the yum, 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 those type of stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Gizmo Kaka and yum, yum, and um, yeah, all kinds of fun stuff like that there. <laughs> That's awesome, actually. That And did, did they bring did they bring you guys back for part two, or is part two just Joe, Don, Joe Dante just, well, I guess he, he did go kind of nuts with part two, and that's part of the fun. They, they used Tony Randall, because the grandma started speaking, and they were intelligent in that, <laughs> but, they, but they listed our voices from the first one for all the you know, for the for the crew of Gremlins. So I didn't actually go into the studio to work on that, but they 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 paid us. You know, I get residuals. They they listed our voices. So they just kind of used what you had recorded before and just continued going. Yeah, and, and you know, and I'm sure they had miles of stuff that was on the cutting room floor that they could just you know. I mean, I worked for five or six days on that on that first film, so they they have oh just a ton of uh, material they could have used for, for Gremlins 2. And there's a rumor they're doing a, a remake. I, I I don't know anything about it, but it's just a rumor that they're going to remake Gremlins, and I hear a rumor that they're going to be doing a sequel to Space Jam. So we shall see. We shall see. Gremlins is one I don't I, I, I don't know if it'll be the same if they try remaking. And Space Jam, this is one we were discussing the other day. Like, if they do it with, like, LeBron James, LeBron James is not the same as Michael Jordan was. Michael Jordan was someone that no matter what happens, you you – he was so popular. What a, a t-shirt, Haynes t-shirt commercial turned into a full-length movie. I recall right. Uh, for Space Jam. Yeah. It was a Nike commercial. Nike commercial. Or, or so it was, yeah, it, was, it, was, yeah, it was, turned into a movie. <laughs> yeah, it was a. Uh, that was uh, the first thing we ever did in that franchise was a Super Bowl uh, Air Jordan spot. Hair Jordan is what they called it. We actually did two. Uh, two in a row, one one year, one the next year, and then uh, Space Jam went into development. So um, 
And which, I, by the way, I still had to audition for. I've had to audition for Porky Pig four times over the last 25 years. Wow. And, and so so you audition for some of the bigger ones, and the other ones, sometimes they'll just call you and be like, we need a Porky Pig? Uh, oh, for the most part, I don't have to audition for Porky Pig anymore. But for Looney, for the Looney Tunes show, I did the pilot, and then they held auditions. So, uh, um, you know, I, I'm kind of used to it now. Uh I, I, you know, I called my agent the first time that happened, and I said, I think it was for Space Jam. The first time I had to re-audition for Porky was for Space Jam. And at the time, I'd been doing the character for five years. And I said to my agent at the time, can't you just, I don't know, say, go into your library. There's five years worth of work and call that an audition. And they said, no, you've got to go in and audition. So um, I did. I auditioned for it, and for Looney Tunes, series. I did the pilot. They held auditions. And, um, you know, again, I don't own these characters. You just have to go with the flow. So, you know, you're, my, my philosophy is always this. If if I audition and somebody's better than damn it, they deserve the job. And I've had 25 great years. But, um, you know, I, you just have to do what you do as an actor. And that, your, your job is to audition. So what, this is a question from a listener. This is about Space Jam, where you got to do the mice, who also ended up doing the announcing, if I recall mm-hmm. right. They want yeah. to know if to be a voice actor, you should have an announcer voice, because so many voice actors will have an announcer voice that they have to use from time to time. Well, first of all, that wasn't me doing the announcer. Oh, so you did the beginning. I wish it's you, I, I wish it's you being Birdie. Oh. Um, announcer voices is not as marketable today as being real. Um, for commercials, they want honest to goodness, real solid actors. They don't want that announcer voice. Um, so if you if you've got that deep, rich bass announcer radio voice, it's kind of difficult today because that's not the style that, that that's in. So the Fontaine style is gone now. What's that? The Fontaine style is is leaving. Well, if you watch a movie trailer, you don't even hear actors as much as you used to. It's a lot of it's a lot of text and a lot of. Uh, fast pictures, but you don't see as much, hear as many uh, announcers. It's still there, but not the way it used to. Um, for commercials, when I first got in the business, it was all announcers. You know, Thank a bad coffee. And it's not that anymore. It's just talking. It's just acting. It's just being real. So again, this is why acting school, acting class is much more important than a voice class if you want to be in voiceover. Okay. Um, here's uh, we're going to have a like three more questions and, and wrap this up. So here's a question from a listener. Uh, recently, um, I don't have his name right here. We we lost one of the voice acting greats. Um, uh, died like two days ago, maybe. Oh, Stan Freeberg. Stan Freeberg, and you know we've lost a lot of others in in recent years. Um, how has you, you said mentioned how people are more are trying to be more real now, and that's what's in. Is, is that the major change that we've had from voice acting from the greats like Freeberg and other ones that that started these things to now and do you think it's going to be changing more in the future or are we at a point where there's so many voice actors, so many different things that that is the style that's going to stay? Well, I mean, you know, everything's relative. You're going to have those wacky zany cartoons and you're going to have those very realistic cartoons and everything in between. The Simpsons is what I call uh, a style where it's cartoony voices with a very believable film-like delivery. Um, it's not Animaniacs. It's not, um, and it's not, it's not as over the top. But there's going to be a style of animation for ever, you know, different styles of animation forever. Um, back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, there weren't that many people that did this because there weren't that many cartoons. There's a lot more animation today than ever before. I mean, when I got into business, there were there were no networks that, that had just cartoons. Now there are several. But back in the you know early days when it was Mel Blanc, June Ferre, uh, Dawes Butler, these people handled everything. Well, first of all, they were contract players. Mel Blanc was under contract with Warner Brothers, so um, they don't have contract players anymore. It's a whole different uh, industry. But they need and they hold auditions every day because they need new talent. They, if they didn't need new talent, they wouldn't be holding auditions. So there's always there's always going to be room for the next best thing, but you got to be really good. Okay. Um, so this next question is something that I hear from voice actors all, all the time, you know, that you know they, they never know when auditions are coming in there, and they have auditions all the time. Sometimes you guys do a lot of them in a day, 
well, a lot of the time you do a lot of them in a day. So how exactly does the audition process work? You said how you have to have a an agent who will send you auditions and so on. Um, so basically, does your agent to say you have, there's like these 10 auditions to do today, send something in for them. H how does it work? And what's the difference between, say, a, an advertisement um, audition versus a cartoon or video game or those type of auditions? Well, first of all, um, the more diverse you are, the more auditions you're going to have. So I kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, I have a home studio. Most of us have home studios. My, my morning ritual is the coffee is on timer. It goes on at 5 a.m. because I have a, a New York agent, and they may need their scripts in by 9 a.m. New York time, which is 6 a.m. my time. So I go into my studio, and whatever auditions I have that are due in that morning, I do them. But throughout the day, I'll get more. Uh, if your agent knows that you're, you work out of a home studio and you're going to make yourself available for auditions throughout the day, then you're one of those actors that they send auditions throughout the day. Um, a commercial is very different from a cartoon. It's just, you know, it's a whole different uh, skill set. It's a whole different uh, delivery. Um, same with a promo. Same with a, a narration. Same with a game. You know, it's just you're know, shifting gears. It's sort of like an on-camera actor. You know, I'm auditioning at 9 o'clock over at Paramount for a new sitcom. But uh, at 3 o'clock, I'm going to Sony to audition for a new drama. All, it's still acting, but you shift gears based on, on, on the genre or the style. So that's all voiceover is. The difference in voiceover is it, it, it's, it's very cold reading. I mean, my agent will send me a piece of copy. This just came in. needs to be in, in an hour. Well, and it's not a lot of preparation time, uh, but voice actors have to be great at cold reading. It's not cold. It's frozen. You know, I might print out five or six scripts, and I got to just walk in that booth and do them. And so, if you're not capable of that, if you don't feel that you're prepared to be able to do that kind of a delivery that fast um, and that uh, competitive, then you're not ready. You hold hold back. You know, don't even pursue it until you're ready, because uh, a bad demo uh, will close more doors than a good one will open. So how how long between like if you get say you do nine auditions today, um, mostly for advertisements. We'll go that one. Since I know with cartoon shows, it's a little bit different. Um, how long before you actually find out if you got the part or not? Is it like a day? Oh my goodness! It... There, there's no way to know. And, and after you audition, you forget about it. So when I audition for I audition for about six things today. Um, I I could I think I can remember one of them. Um, you go about your life. You don't even think about it. If you get it, that's icing on the cake. It might be that afternoon. It might be in six months. You don't know. There's no, there is no rhyme or reason. So if you want to keep your sanity, you read and forget. And then when you get it, you've got to go back into your files and re-listen again to remember what you did because you've got, to, you've got to let it go. You can't hold on to these auditions. You will go crazy. You'll start drinking heavily. You can't. It, it's, it's, you know, it's too difficult. Um, unless it's a major, major something or other, like when I re-auditioned for Porky Pig, the last time, yeah, I kind of sort of wanted that badly. So that was on my mind. But, you know, um, if it's any, anything else, you have, to, you have to let it go. Walk away from it. So when it comes to these auditions, do they usually just uh, – how much freedom do you have to come up with a voice versus them saying, we need this in this type of voice? Or great, great question. They give you as much information as they possibly can. And I say that because sometimes they don't know what they want. And sometimes they're very crystal clear, here's what they want. So if it's really, really like, you know, if it says in the copy, uh, British, snooty, um, uh, works, he's, he's the servant for the king, judgmental, rolls his eyes all the time, always has the answer but feels underappreciated. Well, you take all those descriptions and those wonderful adjectives, and you create something that sort of fits the character like that, you know. But if I go, I look at that and I go, I don't know. There's, there's something. For some reason, I feel I can make him sort of a Harvey Firestein type. I don't know why, but it fits for some reason. So I might give him a take two, where I I take him in a totally different way. Now that's stra that's strategic because. I always give them exactly what they're asking for first. Take two is just, eh, well, let me play with them and show them what I can do. It's an opportunity to show range because when you when you do TV, you're hired for the minimum for scale to do at least two characters. So you want to show versatility. 
But I also want to show that, you know, hey, listen, guys, if you have other characters in the show that you're not thinking of me for, I could probably do them. So there's a lot of thought process that goes into this. But I always try to give them exactly what they're asking for first. Sometimes you get a script where it's really vague. There ain't much information there. He's a guy. He's a dad. And anything goes. Anything goes. Um, I'm a big believer that the script needs a little something-something. That doesn't mean you change the writer's intent. It means you add that little something extra that makes you stand out. What that is um, it depends on the, on the situation, depends on the script, depends on your mood. Um, but you don't change it to the point where, uh, I mean, let's, let's be honest, it goes through a lot of layers of approval before it even gets to the audition. So you need to honor where it is, but you got to add sometimes that little something of yourself that makes you stand out, and you don't know what that is until you get into it. Okay, that's a perfect way to wrap this up. Um, uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna ask the last question now, and then I have a request at the end, which, um, no, for a bumper, if may or may not be able to happen. But um, okay. the last question is that we always give everyone. Uh, we're gonna give you the soapbox so you can promote how people can contact you, any upcoming projects you want people to tune into, uh, social media, anything you want to say to fans, listeners. Uh, we're gonna give you the soapbox, and you can promote away. Oh my goodness. Okay, promote away. Well, let's see. Uh, Wabbit. New Looney Tunes show that hasn't come out yet. We're still recording. Uh, Clarence, Avengers Assembled. Uh, Minions is a movie that comes out in June that I worked on. Um, if people are on Facebook, if you go to All Things Bob Bergen, if you're interested in my weekend cartoon voiceover classes, which I teach around the country throughout the year, two or, two or four times a year, I've got, I've got one in Dallas in May that's got some spaces available that I'm bringing Colette Sunderman with. She's our casting director. Uh, my website, BobBergen.com. You can email me there. I answer everything. If you, if you have questions about the business, if you have demos you want me to listen to, keep them short, but I'm happy to listen and critique, but I will be honest. And I think that's, 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 that's enough. I'm bored with my stuff right now. Awesome. Um, this has been fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. And sure. uh, th this, just so you know, this is going to air in a couple of weeks because uh, Star Wars celebrations next week, and that's going to drain some of my attention span for a little bit. Uh, of course. <laughs> There's going to be lots of news coming out everywhere, um, hopefully. hopefully. So, yeah, there's uh, a new movie, I understand. <laughs> so um, there's uh, – it's going to be a couple of weeks. So if possible, would you be able to record a, a bumper to, just to help promote the, this upcoming episode? Something along the lines of this is uh, Bob Bergen or Porky Pig, um, and you're listening to Bombard Radio. Just something. Uh, yeah, I mean, do you want, do you want all Porky? Oh, that would be awesome. Okay. You ready? Yep. Hey, boys, this is Porky Pig, and you're listening to the Bombard Radio, folks. Thank you. That, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, I will send this to you uh, as soon as it's up. I'll send it to your email and then probably tag you on Facebook and Twitter if I can. Yeah, I'm on Twitter, too, so absolutely. Sounds good. Okay, it'll, just be in a, it'll be in a couple of weeks because of lots of Star Wars news and travel. Sounds good. So thank you so much, and I'm glad it was able to happen. Thank you so much. You betcha. Take care. 